Welcome everyone to our engaging roundtable discussion on the profound impact of the Lord of the Rings movies, a cinematic phenomenon rooted deeply in J.R.R. Tolkien's legendary novels. We're here to unravel how these films have transcended their medium to touch on literature, mythology, and culture at large. It's a pleasure to dive deep into such a rich subject. These films didn't just bring Tolkien's world to life, they also sparked a renewed interest in high fantasy that we hadn't seen in years. While that's true, Amelia, I think it's vital to critique the cultural implications of these adaptations. They've undoubtedly shaped a mainstream perception of Middle-earth, sometimes oversimplifying Tolkien's complexities. Oversimplification or not, Mick, adaptation is an art. Peter Jackson didn't just reconstruct Middle-earth, he reimagined it for the screen. That kind of creative liberty is essential in cinema. Jazz, while creativity is crucial, the fidelity to Tolkien's mythological groundwork can't be overlooked. His world is steeped in Norse and Celtic mythology, which, absolutely. And let's not forget how the films altered the narrative's depth. Tolkien's philosophical musings on power, greed, and corruption sometimes feel glossed over in favor of visual spectacle. Lenny raises a good point about the narrative. However, one could argue that film, as a visual medium, demands a different kind of storytelling. This debate is exactly why we're here today, to navigate these complex waters. And navigate we must. Each adaptation choice has a ripple effect not just on the story's presentation, but on its reception and interpretation by audiences worldwide. Speaking of global audiences, the movies did spark new interest in Tolkien's work across cultures, making them accessible in ways the books alone never achieved. Accessible, but at what cost? The nuance of Tolkien's world can be lost when it's all about the next big battle scene or CGI effect. Yet, those very battle scenes and effects brought Middle-earth to vivid life, making the mythological aspects more palpable to the viewer. Palatable or not, we must critique when essential elements are compromised for mass consumption. All excellent points. Our mission today is to delve deeper into these aspects, exploring the intersections and the divergences between Tolkien's written word and Jackson's cinematic vision. Let's dive in. Let's dive into our first point of discussion, Peter Jackson's adaptation of Tolkien's world. He had a monumental task adapting such rich, detailed novels. Amelia, what's your take on the balance between faithfulness to the source material and creative liberty in the films? Well, Hal, it's a delicate balance. Of course, Jackson made changes for cinematic effect, but what's fascinating is how these changes sometimes illuminated aspects of Tolkien's world in ways the books couldn't. However, I do believe there were instances where the essence of Tolkien's intricate world building was oversimplified. Oversimplified? I'd argue those changes were absolutely necessary. You're dealing with a cinematic audience who needs pacing and visual storytelling. Jackson didn't just make it accessible, he made Tolkien's world visceral, something that literature's internal monologue can't always achieve. But at what cost, Jazz? Sure, it made for great cinema, but in doing so, it altered the cultural perception of Middle-earth. The book's depth, the subtleties of lore and language, get lost. We end up with a version of Middle-earth that's more about spectacle than substance. I see both points, but let's not forget the challenge of visual storytelling. Some of Jackson's liberties brought Tolkien's descriptions to life in ways that words on a page could never convey. It's a different medium. Some translation is necessary. That's true, Izzy. However, Mick raises an important issue about substance. Think about the elves, for instance. Jackson's portrayal leaned heavily into their ethereal qualities, potentially at the expense of their more complex cultural and historical depths. And yet, didn't that ethereal quality make the elves more memorable to viewers? Jackson's visual shorthand connected audiences to Middle Earth in immediate emotional ways. Emotional, perhaps, but at the expense of nuance. Take Faramir's character. His nuanced moral struggle in the books became a simplified narrative of temptation and redemption in the films. It's not just about what's lost in translation, it's about what's deliberately altered for mass consumption. Exactly, Lenny. And those alterations have shaped how people perceive Tolkien's universe. It's a double-edged sword. 
the films introduced Tolkien to a wider audience. But now there's a generation whose understanding of Middle Earth is filtered through Jackson's vision. It's a complex issue, certainly. While we gain a visually stunning Middle Earth, the risk is a homogenized interpretation of Tolkien's work. Yet, without Jackson's adaptation, many might never venture into the rich lore of the books. An excellent point to round off this segment. It's clear there's a tension between preserving the integrity of Tolkien's world and adapting it for a different medium and audience. Our perspectives highlight the multifaceted impact of Jackson's decisions on storytelling, cultural perception, and literary fidelity. Let's carry this thought as we move into our next segment. Let's dive straight into the mythological influences on Middle-earth. Tolkien's work is heavily steeped in Norse and Celtic mythology. Izzy, how do you see this playing out in Jackson's adaptation? Well, Hal, Jackson did an admirable job in visualizing the mythological backbone of Middle-earth. The creation of the elves, for instance, closely mirrors the ethereal qualities of the Aus Sea from Celtic folklore. Yet, I feel the Norse influence, particularly in the portrayal of dwarves and their culture, was somewhat glossed over in favor of a more generic fantasy portrayal. I have to disagree there, Izzy. The depth of Norse mythology in Jackson's adaptation is palpable, especially in depiction of heroism and fate, core aspects of Norse mythology. The entire concept of Middle-earth, a direct translation of Midgard, pays homage to these mythologies seamlessly. Both points are noteworthy, but let's not forget the cinematic medium's limitations. Jackson had to prioritize which elements to foreground. I argue the essence of these mythologies was captured, especially in the overarching themes of camaraderie and sacrifice. But that's precisely where the problem lies. The complexities of these mythologies aren't just about heroism and camaraderie. There's a darkness and moral ambiguity in Norse and Celtic mythologies that the films, constrained perhaps by their need for a broad appeal, significantly downplayed. Exactly, Nick. And what about the Silmarils? They're central to Tolkien's mythological universe, akin to the cursed treasures in Norse myths. Jackson's films, understandably focused on the Lord of the Rings saga, barely touch upon this rich mythological tapestry. Sorry, fabric. It's a missed opportunity to showcase the depth of Tolkien's mythological research and narrative complexity. While I acknowledge that, Izzy, I think it's essential to recognize the films brought Tolkien's world to a vast audience, many of whom delved deeper into his legendarium as a result. Isn't broadening the audience for these stories a win for mythology as well? Broadening an audience doesn't necessarily mean the essence is preserved. Norse and Celtic mythologies are about the intertwining of fate, the inevitable doom, and the heroic struggle against it. These nuances, while hinted at in the films, are largely lost in translation. But Lenny, the monumental task of adapting such dense works inevitably demands sacrifice. What Jackson chose to focus on still conveys a sense of grandeur and the mythological echoes that reverberate through Tolkien's world. These are all excellent points. It seems we're touching on a fundamental tension between fidelity to complex source material and the practicalities of cinematic storytelling. Izzy, you mentioned the portrayal of elves and dwarves as one area where the films diverge from their mythological roots. Can you expand on that? Sure, Hal. In Tolkien's work, dwarves are a profound blend of Norse mythological beings and his unique creativity, embodying craftsmanship, wisdom, and a deep connection to the earth. The films, while capturing their craftsmanship, often reduce dwarves to comic relief. Elves, on the other hand, retain their ethereal, almost unreachable quality, which aligns more closely with Celtic myths. However, the sense of loss, a theme so prevalent in Tolkien's depiction of elves and their realms, doesn't always translate with the depth I'd hoped for in the films. And let's not overlook the adaptation's handling of magic and mysticism, central to both mythological traditions and Tolkien's work. The films occasionally err on the side of spectacle over subtlety. Well, Mick, cinema is an art of the spectacle. It's unfair to expect the nuanced storytelling possible in a novel to translate directly to screen without some adjustments for visual impact. It's clear there are varied perspectives on how Jackson interpreted Tolkien's mythological influences for the big screen. 
From adaptation challenges to the balance between myth and cinematic spectacle, there's a lot to consider. The intersection of Norse and Celtic mythologies with Tolkien's narrative world is a deeply intricate one. And while the films may not capture every nuance, their impact and intent spark important conversations like this one. Welcome back. Now let's delve into the representation of good versus evil in the films versus the literature of Tolkien. Lenny, you've expressed some strong opinions on the nuances lost in translation. Care to elaborate? Absolutely. The books imbue characters with rich complexities that the films just glaze over. It's black and white. You're either good or evil with hardly any in between. Take Denethor or Faramir. Their moral struggles are far more nuanced in the books. I must disagree, Lenny. The visual medium necessitates brevity. Jackson did a fantastic job visually distinguishing between good and evil. Think about the ethereal glow of Galadriel versus the shadowy depths of Mordor. It's impactful and efficient storytelling. Jazz makes a valid point, yet Lenny's right about character depth. But we should also consider how the narrative's context changes this portrayal. It's not simply about good versus evil, but also about the choices characters make and what those choices say about them. Choices, yes, but let's not ignore the societal structures at play here. Jackson's movies sometimes feel like they're reinforcing traditional power dynamics without the subtlety Tolkien managed to weave into his narrative. It's not just good versus evil, but also power, corruption, and resistance. True, Mick, but both mediums do embrace the hero's journey archetype. That inherently involves the struggle between light and dark, internally and externally. The movies perhaps simplify these concepts, but still manage to evoke a powerful message about courage and sacrifice. But isn't it precisely that simplification that does a disservice to Tolkien's work? The film's portrayal almost sanitizes the complexity of its characters. I interrupt. But didn't that simplification also introduce Tolkien's work to a broader audience? The essence of the conflict, the essence of good challenging evil, is still very much alive in the films. Jazz, while broader accessibility is important, it shouldn't come at the cost of depth. Tolkien's work is celebrated not just for its epic battles, but for how it handles moral ambiguity. The films occasionally lose that subtlety in translation. The cultural context cannot be overlooked either. The films were made in a different time than when Tolkien wrote his books. The clear-cut division between good and evil resonates differently with modern audiences, possibly necessitating a somewhat altered portrayal. And let's not forget, both the films and the books offer valuable insights into the nature of evil and the continual fight against it. Perhaps the medium alters the message, but the core themes remain potent in both adaptations. This has been a fervent discussion. It's clear that the transformation from page to screen has both its proponents and critics. What stands out is the enduring strength of Tolkien's creation, capable of sparking such passionate debate decades after its inception. Let's jump into the environmental themes within Tolkien's universe and how these were translated into Peter Jackson's films. Mick, your thoughts? Tolkien's environmental messages were profound, especially his deep reverence for nature. While Jackson visually captured Middle-earth's landscapes beautifully, I feel the urgency of Tolkien's environmentalism was somewhat lost in the cinematic spectacle. I must disagree there, Mick. The visual grandeur of the films brings Middle-earth to life, yes, but it also highlights the stark contrast between the industrial wasteland of Isengard and the lush wholesomeness of the Shire. This visual storytelling reinforces Tolkien's environmental cautionary tales. Izzy, the contrast is there, but it's the subtlety of Tolkien's environmental messaging, like the Ensis storyline, that gets overshadowed by the epic battles. It's a matter of focus. Mick does have a point. In literature, we're given more opportunity to delve into the nuances of these themes. However, the films did a commendable job within the constraints of cinema. The Ents attacking Isengard is a powerful visual metaphor for nature fighting back against industrialization. But Amelia, couldn't it also be said that the films, by virtue of their medium, democratize Tolkien's message? Not everyone will pick up the books, 
but the movies made Middle Earth accessible, and with it, the message that nature is something to be cherished and protected. It's fascinating, jazz, though I wonder if that message wasn't somewhat diluted in the translation from text to screen. The subtlety of Tolkien's prose, the gentle reminder of nature's might, becomes in the movie just another battle scene. But Lenny, doesn't the sheer visual impact of those scenes leave an indelible mark on the viewer? It's one thing to read about the beauty of Rivendell, and another to see it, to feel a sense of loss at its endangerment. Jackson delivered that feeling on a silver platter. There's truth in what everyone is saying, but let's also talk about the allegorical role of nature in Tolkien's myth. Izzy? Tolkien infused his narrative with mythological significance, where nature is not merely a backdrop, but an active participant. The films capture this, though perhaps more could have been done to highlight nature as a character in its own right. I'll concede that the films did visually capture Middle-earth exquisitely, but the narrative urgency of environmentalism was not the focal point. It became but a thread in a larger tapestry, overshadowed by the war against Sauron. Mick, that's the nature of film adaptation. We gain the visual splendor, but we lose some narrative depth. It's a trade-off. Yet I argue the films still carry Tolkien's environmental torch, albeit in a different form. Jazz is right, we must appreciate the different mediums for what they offer. The books invite contemplation, while the films can provoke awe and immediate emotional response. Both are valuable in conveying Tolkien's love for nature. And that's the beauty of adaptation. It sparks debate like this, showing the multifaceted ways in which Tolkien's work continues to inspire and provoke thought. Let's remember, his reverence for nature is something that transcends medium. Let's delve into the evolution of heroism in Tolkien's work. Jazz, you've mentioned a modern shift in hero archetypes. How do you see this playing out in Loder? Definitely. Tolkien's heroes, like Frodo and Aragorn, start from a traditional mold. They're essentially good, facing outward evils. But the genius of Tolkien, which I feel the films capture well, is showing that real heroism often comes from the internal struggle. It's about overcoming doubt and fear, which to me feels like a precursor to our current fascination with anti-heroes. But don't you think, Jazz, that by focusing too much on these internal struggles, the movies lose sight of the traditional heroism that Tolkien celebrated? The books have a clarity of right and wrong that the movies muddy. Lenny, I'd argue that it's not a loss, but an evolution. Audiences today connect with complexity. Yes, Tolkien celebrated traditional heroism, but the story's depth comes from its characters' vulnerabilities. I have to agree with Jazz here. Tolkien himself was steeped in literature that often explored the complexity of heroism. Think of Frodo's journey. It's as much about his resilience as it is about his temptation and eventual failure to destroy the ring on his own. The movies just highlight this modern reading of heroism. But isn't there a danger in overemphasizing these internal struggles? Do you not think, Amelia, that it risks overshadowing the societal and collective aspects of Tolkien's heroism? The Fellowship's journey, after all, is a group effort. That's a fair point, Mick. But exploring individual struggles doesn't necessarily negate the collective effort. It enriches it. When we see individual weaknesses and strengths, the collective success of the Fellowship becomes even more profound. Picking up on what Mick and Amelia are saying, I think there's a mythological dimension here. Many myths deal with the hero's personal journey and transformation. Tolkien was drawing on that tradition, and the films, in focusing on internal conflicts, are very much in line with this mythological framework. Lenny, does this sway your thoughts at all on the movie's portrayal of heroism? To some extent, yes. I see the value in exploring internal conflicts. However, I remain concerned that the cinematic emphasis might overshadow the moral clarity and the traditional mythic elements of heroism that Tolkien so loved. But don't you think, Lenny, that moral clarity isn't lost, but rather it's shown to be hard won? That makes it all the more satisfying and, dare I say, realistic. While that's an interesting perspective, I suppose my issue is with the balance. The movies could do better at preserving the traditional heroism alongside the modern interpretation. It seems we all agree that Tolkien's work 
is a fertile ground for exploring heroism's many facets, even if we diverge on how well the movies manage this balance. The discussion highlights both the timelessness of Tolkien's themes and the adaptability of his stories to different audiences and eras. Let's delve into the socio-political dynamics of Middle-earth. Mick, your take on the real-world parallels is always intriguing. Yes, thank you, Hal. Tolkien's Middle-earth isn't just fantasy, it's a mirror to our world's history. The division among races, the conflicts, they're reminiscent of our own socio-political upheavals. It's not just fictional lore, it's a commentary. But Mick, don't you think by saying that, you're oversimplifying the depth of Tolkien's work? It's not merely a reflection of our world politics, but an exploration into the complexity of power and morality. While that's a fair observation, Izzy, I believe acknowledging real-world parallels doesn't necessarily diminish the depth. It enriches it by connecting us more deeply to the narrative. I've got to side with Mick here, but I'd go a step further and say that the movies somewhat diluted this complexity. The nuanced politics of Tolkien's text are often overshadowed by cinematic spectacle. Jazz, that's a point well made. The films, as visually stunning as they are, do seem to prioritize spectacle over depth. It's a limitation of the medium, perhaps, but it's there. Lenny, Jazz, while your points on cinematic limitation hold weight, don't disregard the effort to visually convey these socio-political undercurrents. It's a Herculean task to translate such intricacies onto screen. And yet, where does that leave the representation of races and nations? The movies could propagate simplistic views if not careful. The dwarves, elves, humans, their depiction carries weight. True, Izzy. It's a double-edged sword. On one hand, highlighting diversity, on the other, risking stereotype. The films tread a thin line. It seems we're touching on a critical aspect here, whether the films manage to convey the same socio-political nuance as the books. Lenny, you've been vocal about cinematic limitations. Do you think they succeeded? Partially, how? The films capture the essence, but the depth of Tolkien's socio-political commentary is somewhat lost. It's the inevitable loss in translation from book to film. But isn't that the crux of adaptation? It's not about a direct translation, it's about capturing the spirit. And in that, Jackson succeeded. The essence of Middle-earth's complex society is there, if not all the intricate detail. Agreeing with Jazz here, the spirit is what matters. And regarding the societal structures and tensions, the films open a door. It's up to us, the audience, to step through and explore further. An optimistic view, but reality often tells a different story. Not all viewers delve deeper, leading to a superficial understanding of Tolkien's rich socio-political landscape. A valid concern, Izzy. This roundtable itself is a testament to the depth and ongoing debate surrounding Tolkien's work proving that both the books and films offer layers of interpretation, each valuable in its own right. Let's dive into a crucial aspect of Tolkien's world and its cinematic adaptation, the depiction of female characters. It's a topic that I believe sparks a variety of opinions. So Amelia, would you kick us off by sharing your perspective on the transition of female roles from page to screen? Certainly, Hal. One of the most significant shifts was undoubtedly the enhancement of certain characters, like Arwen. In the books, she's more of a background figure, but the films elevate her to a more active and present role. It's an interesting choice by Jackson, serving both narrative need and a modern audience's expectations. I have to jump in here because, while I see your point, Amelia, about modernizing characters for contemporary audiences, I sometimes feel it strays a bit too far from Tolkien's original portrayals. It's vital we gain a modern perspective, but it raises the question, are we altering the essence of Tolkien's work? Well, Jazz, Tolkien was writing in a different era and his work reflects that. The mythological framework he drew from often relegated female figures to specific archetypes. Jackson's adaptations, in a way, liberate these characters from those confines, allowing for a richer storytelling canvas. But then aren't we risking the integrity of the source material? It's a delicate balance, and while I appreciate the effort to bring more depth to female characters, 
I'm concerned about the selective inflation of certain roles for spectacle over substance. It's a fair concern, Mick. However, consider Eowyn's portrayal. Both the book and the films did her justice, perfectly balancing her strength and vulnerability. It's a case where Jackson didn't just inflate a character's role, but brought Tolkien's own vision to life in a faithful yet resonant way. Lenny makes a crucial point, and regarding Eowyn, Tolkien himself wrote one of the most critical affirmations of female agency in fantasy literature. Jackson didn't have to stretch far. The material provided a strong template for a screen adaptation that both respects the source and speaks to a 21st century audience. Amelia, while Eowyn's portrayal is commendable, it doesn't completely absolve the filmmakers of overstepping in other areas. The addition of Toriel in the Hobbit trilogy, for instance, feels like a misstep. An invented character to shoehorn a love story that wasn't there, it complicates matters. Jazz, I see your point with Toriel, but isn't adaptation about capturing the spirit rather than a direct translation? Changes, even significant ones, serve to bring the essence of the story to those who might not access it otherwise. Spirit is one thing, but outright invention risks undermining the thematic and narrative coherence of the world Tolkien meticulously built. Where do we draw the line? A vital question, Mick. Adaptation does require a certain liberty, but maintaining the essence of the source material is key, especially with a legacy as rich as Tolkien's. The debate on fidelity versus creative liberty in the depiction of female characters in Loder is far from resolved, but it's clear it comes down to a matter of balance and respect for both the original work and the audience's evolving sensibilities. Let's continue to explore these themes as we move on. Let's dive into the realms of Middle-earth through its language and dialect. How do you think the films handled Tolkien's linguistic creation? Tolkien was a philologist. His creation of Elvish languages was not just a detail, it was central to the lifeblood of Middle-earth. The films, I'd argue, only skim the surface of this linguistic depth. I echo Izzy's sentiment. Language in Tolkien's work isn't just about communication, it's about history, culture, and identity. However, the films had a monumental task, and within that scope, I think they managed to respect the essence of Tolkien's linguistics to a respectable degree. Respect the essence? They barely scratched the surface. If you don't delve deeply into the languages, you miss the essence of the characters. The films, while visually stunning, fail to fully capture the characters' essence, as Tolkien intended, through their linguistic diversity. I'm gonna have to jump in here. While the depth of Tolkien's languages is undeniable, we have to recognize the medium differences. Film communicates visually. It was strategic to focus more on visual storytelling than linguistic fidelity. Strategic, maybe, but it's a significant loss. Language shapes our understanding of Middle-earth societies. The film's simplified approach strips layers of meaning from the narrative, making it a shadow of Tolkien's complex creation. But let's not overlook the effort to incorporate those languages into the script and soundtrack. Those elements did enrich the film's atmosphere, giving at least a glimpse into Tolkien's linguistic universe. Glimpse, yes, but it's about what connects with the audience. The visual iconography of the films, think of the One Ring, carries more immediate impact for most viewers than the subtleties of Sindarin or Quenya. Immediate impact doesn't equal lasting depth. Tolkien's written work lingers because of its complexities, including the languages. The films, by narrowing that focus, arguably offer a more transient experience. Exactly, Amelia. And it's not just about linguistic depth. It's about how those languages contribute to world building and character development. The films miss much of the intricate relationships between different Middle-earth cultures by diluting the languages. Understandable, given the constraints of filmmaking but let's not downplay the missed opportunities for enriching the narrative and cultural portrayals through fuller linguistic representation. So, it seems we agree that while the films made efforts to incorporate Tolkien's languages, there's a consensus that much of the richness and depth of Middle-earth's linguistics was inevitably left behind. This, however, does open spaces for interpretation and adaptability across mediums even if it means the loss of some of Tolkien's original intent. 
Let's dive into how The Lord of the Rings has reshaped the landscape of modern fantasy, both in literature and cinema. Jazz, your take on this? Well, Hal, Peter Jackson didn't just make a film trilogy, he revitalized an entire genre. Before Loder, fantasy was largely niche, something not fully mainstream. Jackson propelled it into the global spotlight, and now we see fantasy elements in almost every other blockbuster. I've got to interrupt, Jazz. Yes, the films were a cultural phenomenon, but to say they single-handedly revitalized the genre ignores the rich fantasy traditions that predate the movies. The films built on an already burgeoning interest in fantasy prompted by literature and gaming. Mick, I think you're partly right, but it's hard to deny the unprecedented scale of Loder's influence. After the films, there was a notable surge in fantasy novels, many of which openly drew inspiration from Tolkien's work. The visual language Jackson crafted has become a blueprint for epic fantasy storytelling in cinema. Exactly, Amelia. And it's not just about the quantity of fantasy media, but the quality. The standard for world building, character arcs, and even the use of CGI was permanently elevated. Hold on a moment, Jazz. Elevated? If anything, the surge in fantasy films and books post Lota saw a flood of mediocre imitations that relied too heavily on CGI and spectacle over substantive storytelling. We can't confuse influence with improvement. Lenny makes a critical point. Yet what's fascinating is observing how different cultures have interpreted and adapted the fantasy genre post Loder. It sparked a global conversation, leading to diverse narratives that may not have emerged otherwise. That globalization of fantasy is essential, Izzy. But let's not overlook the commercialization aspect. Loader showed that fantasy could be immensely profitable, leading to some projects prioritizing commercial success over creative integrity. Well, commercial success isn't inherently negative, Nick. It can provide the resources necessary for creatives to bring visionary projects to life. The key is balancing artistic integrity with commercial appeal, something the Loader managed quite well. And beyond cinema, look at literature. New authors were inspired not just to emulate Tolkien, but to innovate, challenging and expanding the boundaries of the genre. It's an ongoing ripple effect. This has been a fervent exchange, clearly demonstrating Loder's profound impact on the fantasy genre. Whether viewed as a catalyst for commercialization or a beacon of creative inspiration, its legacy in shaping modern fantasy is undeniable. Let's dive into the One Ring symbolism across different cultures. Izzy, you mentioned earlier a fascinating point about its interpretation. Care to elaborate? Certainly, Hal. The One Ring essentially embodies power and the corruptibility it brings, themes universal in many myths. Within Norse mythology, there's a concept of objects with great power that bring doom to those who wield them. Tolkien, being profoundly influenced by these myths, captures this beautifully. I agree with Izzy on the mythological parallels, but think we're missing the contemporary resonance. The One Ring, to me, reflects our current societal obsession with power and control, whether it's political, economic, or even social. Tolkien's ring has become a modern metaphor for the ultimate corrupter, unchecked ambition. While that's a captivating point, Mick, I think it oversimplifies the symbol. In a modern context, the One Ring also represents addiction, and the human struggle with inner demons. It's not just about societal power, but personal battles, a nuance I feel gets lost when we discuss only the broad strokes of corruption and ambition. Jazz, that's an insightful angle. Building on it from a literary standpoint, the ring's allure and the character's reactions to it are quintessential to understanding human nature. Each character's response is a deep, narrative exploration of temptation, moral integrity, and the fear of losing oneself. This literary complexity is what enthralls readers and viewers alike. But let's not forget, the cinematic portrayal emphasizes its role as a plot device more than its symbolic nature. Whereas in literature, the symbolism can be nuanced and meticulously unpacked, cinema has to visualize this struggle, which can, unfortunately, dilute some of its deeper meanings. I must interrupt, Lenny. On the contrary, the film's visual and auditory cues make the One Ring symbolism even more palpable for the audience. Think of how its whisper amplifies its seductive nature, making its corruptive power not just an abstract concept, but a visceral experience. 
But Izzy, don't you think that making it palpable, as you say, risks oversimplifying the rich ambiguities Tolkien so carefully wove into the ring's narrative? The medium's limitations mean some of the subtlety gets lost. I have to side with Mick here. The book allows for a layered interpretation that the film, by its nature, can only hint at. However, acknowledging that, the filmmakers did an admirable job of capturing its essence, which isn't a minor feat. On this, I see both sides. The film's visualization of the One Ring brings it to life in a way words alone might not. Yet the literary form allows for a more profound engagement with its symbolism. This debate itself highlights the richness of Tolkien's creation, transcending mediums and inviting endless discussion. This has been a heated and enlightening discussion on the One Ring's multifaceted symbolism. Its interpretation, be it through mythological, contemporary, literary, or cinematic lenses, reveals the depth of Tolkien's work and its lasting impact on both literature and film. Well, as we near the end of our journey through Middle-earth in the context of cinema and literature, I'd like to hear your final thoughts, starting with the enduring legacy of the Loder movies. Amelia? The legacy, Hal, is monumental. The way these films brought Tolkien's world to the forefront of popular culture cannot be overstated. However, I've consistently felt that the richness of Tolkien's literature was somewhat overshadowed by the visual spectacle. The depth of his literary world offers more than the films could ever encapsulate. I hear you, Amelia, but let's not downplay the film's achievement. Peter Jackson did what was considered impossible. He made Middle Earth visually alive. The legacy is not just in storytelling, but in pioneering filmmaking techniques. Without Jackson's vision, we wouldn't have the advancements in special effects that we see today. Jazz makes a compelling point, Amelia. Yet, the cultural impact, while substantial, has its drawbacks. The film simplified the complexities of Tolkien's themes, catering to a public not necessarily inclined to seek the depth of the original work. It's a double-edged sword. Simplified? I'd argue the films elevated the source material for a wider audience. They made people who would never pick up a thousand-page book interested in Tolkien's world. That's an achievement. I agree with Lenny to an extent. However, we can't ignore that the cinematic adaptation has somewhat diluted the mythological richness Tolkien so meticulously crafted. The movies, while visually spectacular, occasionally miss the philosophical underpinnings that give the novels their true power. Indeed, the films and novels offer different experiences. Jazz, earlier you mentioned the advancements in special effects. Do you believe that this focus on technology detracted from the storytelling? Not at all, Hal. The technology was in service of the story. The creation of Gollum alone was groundbreaking and brought a depth to the character that resonated with audiences worldwide. If anything, the use of these technologies enhanced the narrative. But at what cost, Jazz? Sure, Gollum was a triumph of visual effects, but in focusing so much on such elements, did we lose some of the narrative's depth? The introspection and the moral complexities of the characters sometimes felt sidelined. Amelia does have a point. The spectacle sometimes overshadowed the subtleties of Tolkien's narrative. It's crucial to acknowledge that while the films did many things right, they also simplified aspects that were significant in the books. And let's not forget the additions and deviations from the source material that stirred quite a bit of controversy among purists. These changes were often made for cinematic pacing, but at the expense of what some fans considered crucial elements. Controversy aside, these movies did more for high fantasy as a genre than any literary critique or scholarly analysis ever could. They brought it into the mainstream, making way for an explosion of interest in fantasy literature and cinema. It's clear that our views on the legacy of the Loder movies vary greatly, reflecting the multifaceted impact these films have had on literature, cinema, and beyond. As we close our discussion, it's evident that whether through contention or admiration, the significance of Peter Jackson's adaptation is undeniable. Precisely, Hal. And despite our disagreements, one thing is clear. The Loader movies have left an indelible mark, shaping not just the landscape of cinema, but also how we engage with fantasy as a genre. Thank you, everyone, for a spirited and enlightening discussion. 
Tolkien's work and its adaptation continue to inspire debate and passion, proving the timeless nature of the stories from Middle-earth.